There are a lot of types of LSAT questions out there, and a lot of prep companies tend to overcomplicate the LSAT by categorizing them into categories and subcategories, far too much to hold in your head all at the same time. Today, I'm going to break down with you how I simplified the LSAT for myself and brought my LSAT score up by over 20 points. For those who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I've been teaching the LSAT since 2005, and I personally increased my LSAT score from a 152 to a 175. Now, back when I was studying for the LSAT, I got bogged down by all the 15 different types of logical reasoning questions, all these overcomplicated note-taking strategies for reading comp, and I found that I was able to increase my LSAT score significantly by throwing all that out the window and focusing on actually understanding what I was reading. If I stopped thinking about logical reasoning question stem types, for example, and I actually understood the argument, my score went up significantly. Same thing for reading comp, when I stopped highlighting and underlining and taking notes and instead just focus on actually understanding the main idea of the passage. So today I'm gonna to walk you through some strategies for both logical reasoning and reading comp that'll work for you whenever you're taking the LSAT. For logical reasoning, focus on understanding the method of reasoning in the stimulus, AKA the argument. What's the conclusion? What's the evidence? What's the gap between the two? That's it. And for any question that you get wrong or have difficulty with, you want to drill down into exactly where your misunderstanding stemmed from. Was it the argument? Was it the question stem? Or was it the answer choices? If it was the argument, did you have trouble identifying the conclusion or the evidence or the gap between the two? Were you thrown off by the absence of key indicator words for the evidence or for the conclusion? If it was that you misidentified the question stem type, how can you better drill to make sure that you are crystal clear on what the question is asking you for? If it was in the answer choices, what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made you pick it, and what ultimately made it wrong. If it was an unappealing right answer, what was unappealing about it, and what ultimately makes it correct? Because you have these traps of encouragement towards the wrong answer, and traps of discouragement away from the right answer. And until you understand which tricks and traps you personally are uniquely prone to falling for, you may of course end up just making the same mistake again. And of course, I recommend adopting a review process like this to help you figure it out. If you'd like my help, this is part of the Socratic review method that we adopted at Elson Unplugged for all of our programs, whether you're in our one-on-one -on -one coaching program or our small group program. If you're interested in finding out more, you can check out the links below to book a call with me and my team. We'd be glad to help you out. Now, of course, while drilling LSAT questions by question stem type is overemphasized by a lot of prep companies out there, it does have its place. That being said, you want to focus on the relatively more common types of logical reasoning questions, those that take up a larger percentage of questions on the LSAT, like necessary assumption, inference, and flaw. You don't want to overemphasize the rare types that hardly ever come up, like evaluate the argument or parallel questions that only show up once or twice per section. You'll get a lot more bang for your buck if you focus on the most common types of LSAT questions to start with, and you want to make sure, of course, that you're also crystal clear on indicator words indicator words for necessary and sufficient conditions, indicator words for evidence and conclusion. If you're not clear on those, you're in trouble. But the good news is that even if your LSAT is just a month or two away, there's still plenty of time to drill those and get them down pat so that when you interpret a new argument, you'll know how to bucket the various pieces of the argument and better evaluate the method of reasoning in that argument. Now, I'm going to share with you right now three quick strategies for logical reasoning you can implement right away, three important distinctions that a lot of students are missing. You want to make sure that, for example, you are crystal clear on the difference between necessary assumption questions and sufficient assumption questions. Some students in some prep companies lump them together under the catch-all category of assumption, which is a huge mistake because they are asking for very different things. Necessary assumption questions are actually a very specific kind of must-be-true question because, after all, the assumption is necessary in order for the argument to work. In contrast, sufficient assumption questions are opening the door for new information. Doesn't matter how strong or extreme it is, as long as it gets the job done of guaranteeing the argument. You also want to make sure that you recognize the difference between must-be-true questions and most strongly supported questions. You could lump them together under the umbrella of inference questions, but there is a small important nuance between the two, which is that must be true questions, the correct answer is 100% guaranteed by the stimulus. Whereas for most strongly supported questions, there is a little bit of wiggle room, meaning the correct answer does not need to be 100% guaranteed by the stimulus. You also want to be clear on the difference between weakened questions and cannot be true questions. 
weakened questions expose a gap in the argument, making the conclusion relatively less likely given the evidence, but they do not have to destroy the argument. In contrast, a cannot be true question is asking you for something that is prohibited by the stimulus and is incompatible with it. Now, of course, at Elsa Unplugged, we'll cover all 15 different types of logical reasoning questions for you and give you an approach that focuses on actually understanding the method of reasoning in the argument. If you're interested in finding out more, links below to book a call with me and my team. We'd be glad to help you out. Now, for reading comprehension, a lot of prep companies overemphasize highlighting, underlining, taking notes. All of this sounds great in theory, but it doesn't actually work on test day for a couple of reasons. One is that it's incredibly time consuming and the LSAT is strictly timed. The other thing, is that LSAC's tools for highlighting and underlining are oftentimes quite glitchy and imprecise. You don't want to waste time on those on test day. And so I found for me personally that I did a lot better on LSAC reading comp when I did less. When I stopped taking notes, when I stopped underlining, when I stopped highlighting and just focused on one key piece of information, namely, what is the author's opinion? What is the main idea of the passage? And what you end up writing down oftentimes isn't even that useful for helping you solve the questions. Now, that being said, there is some benefit in certain cases to taking notes as part of your review process. For example, if you're having difficulty understanding the text of the passage, you might try as an exercise rewriting the entire passage in simpler language as if you were going to explain it to a five-year-old. Of course, you can't do this on test day and you don't want to do this for all of the passages, but given that there are about 400 real official released LSAT reading comp passages, you could save a hundred of them for drills where you're rewriting the entire thing or where you're solving only the general global main idea questions to make sure that you actually understand what is the main idea of the passage. Because of course, to be frank, if you don't know the main idea, you don't know anything, right? And so we want to make sure that you're first and foremost, you're getting that down and solving those questions first, then doing the detail oriented questions that require a, a bit more going back to the passage to specific lines to support your choice, and finally saving the more inferential questions for last, the ones that require a bit more reading between the lines. And this, by the way, is the exact order in which I recommend approaching the questions on test day itself. General global questions first, like main idea, primary purpose, passage organization, best title, tone, author's opinion. Knock those out first. Those are your gimmies. Those are your warm-ups. Then you approach the local questions next, the ones where you're going to want to maybe go back to the passage for specific lines to support your given choice. And finally, saving the more inferential questions for last, the ones that require a bit more inference, the ones that require a bit more reading between the lines, the ones that are analogous to some harder logical reasoning questions, you save those for last. Anyway, folks, that's all for now. Hope you found this helpful. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.